And at this time, we're beginning the March 17th, St. Patrick's Day meeting of the Alamos History Association. And I hope you all have your pint of Guinness uh, over there uh, to enjoy later. I want to introduce Pam, who's going to talk about Malinche. And uh, we're all waiting. I just love this history of uh, the conquest of, of Mexico. And thank you, Pam, for devoting, uh, for researching and devoting to this uh, topic. So Pam, I, just, I introduce you and our meeting is beginning. I just want to say one thing. Tomorrow would be our mother's 106th birthday. Oh, oh wow. no. my. Oh, brother. Well, dear Leia, oh. I'll tell you, I, she was such a treasure. Welcome to the Alamos History Association. The presentation today is Malinche the woman who facilitated the conquest of the Aztec kingdom. The indigenous woman who became known as Malinche is one of the most noteworthy figures in the history of the early conquest of Mexico, a conquest led by the Spaniard Hernando Cortez. This is the only remaining depiction of him painted during his lifetime. It's from 1529. From the beginning of Cortez's expedition in 1519, Malinche became his translator and eventually took on the role as cultural interpreter and negotiator between the Spanish and Nahuatl and Maya speaking peoples. A bright and talented person she quickly picked up Spanish. This is a picture of uh, an engraving picture of Malinche from 1885. Um, there were a number of imaginative portrayals of her. Historian Camilla Townsend has written about Malinche and I lean heavily on her insights and text in the presentation here. The word Aztec is commonly used to refer to the kingdom, but the people who founded the kingdom referred to themselves as Mexica. Malinche was most likely born about the year 1500. Her Nahuatl speaking family was of noble background. The Nahuatl language was spoken mostly in central Mexico. The region where she was born, close to today's Veracruz, was to the east of the Aztec kingdom and was targeted by the Mexica people who ruled that kingdom. So you can see, um, right, you can, Tenochtitlan is where Mexico City is today, so you can see where it is in Mexico. Between the age of 8 and 12, under unclear circumstances involving Mexica aggression, Malinche was captured and sold to the Chantal Maya people as a slave. Among them, she learned the Chantal Maya language and some Yucatec Maya, which was linguistically close to Chantal Maya. For several years, Spaniards traveling from the Caribbean had been approaching Yucatan coast. And in 1517, a Spanish boat arrived at a Chantal Maya town. They were driven off with many of their men badly wounded, but they left many Chantal warriors wounded and dying. In 1518, the Spaniards returned this time with a young Maya prisoner who had learned some Spanish. The prisoner told the Chantal warriors that the Spanish were dangerous and that they sought gold and food in regular supplies. The Chantal told them that the Machica of the Aztec kingdom to the west were the people to seek for gold and other precious goods. In 1519, 10 ships showed up at Potanchan 
the leading settlement of the Chantal Maya, a group of Spaniards led by Hernando Cortes came ashore and there was a battle. The indigenous warriors were armored only in padded cotton and their stone arrowheads and spear tips could not penetrate the metal armor of the Spanish. The Spanish steel weapons were lethal. Two days later, more Spaniards from the same ships showed up with 10 horses. The latter were something new to the warriors. The horsemen cut down Chantal foot soldiers who had to withdraw. The Chantal had lost 220 warriors in only a few hours of combat. Their leaders thought it likely that more of these strangers would arrive next year, so they sued for peace. One of the Spaniards was a man, Geronimo de Aguilar, whose ship eight years earlier had capsized near Cancun and who had been taken prisoner on the Yucatan Peninsula. He spoke some Yucatec Maya, comprehensible to the Chantal. De Aguilar told the Chantal that Cortez would be forgiving would forgive the Chantal for resisting them if they made amends. In return, the Chantal brought many gifts, including 20 slave girls. One of these girls was a person who would become known as Malinche. First though, the Spanish gave her the name Marina. Cortez gave her to a high-ranking man among them, Alonso Puerto Carrero, from a Spanish noble family. Over 400 fighting men and 100 or so servants and retainers had come from the Caribbean with Cortez. Cortez's men were convinced that better things lay ahead for them than what they had found in the Caribbean. They could become a danger to their own leaders if they did not find what they sought. The Chantal Maya, in their interactions with these strangers, continued to argue that the Mexica would be able to supply what they wanted. After some days, the Spaniards returned to their ships with the 20 enslaved women and headed west to a point on the site of today's Better Cruz. Men in two canoes, emissaries from the Aztec king Moctezuma came out to meet the flagship holding Cortez. The Maya speaking de Aguilar could not communicate with them because they spoke Nahuatl. Slave girl Marina came forward knowing both Nahuatl and Maya and told Aguilar what they were saying, which he conveyed to Cortez. Marina made her full value felt, and so Cortez later claimed, he took her aside along with the Aguilar and promised her, quote, more than her liberty, that is to say, more than freedom from slavery, if she would help him find and speak to this Moctezuma about whom he had heard so much. Cortez meant that he would make her rich. That is what he told everyone who agreed to help him. This is a depiction of Moctezuma from 1541 made by an indigenous artist after the conquest. And this is a late 18th century imagining of Moctezuma. From the pictures I've seen, the clothes he's wearing are somewhat of the time, but this, of course, is a fantasy. Historian Townsend thinks it is doubtful that Marina acted out of interest in riches promised by an interloper whom she had no reason to trust. Her motivations were likely much different. As it was, 
She was the concubine of Puerto Carrero. When he tired of her or was killed, she would most likely be passed on to another Spaniard and might even become the common property of the men. Alternatively, she could speak aloud, earning the respect and gratitude of the men, especially their leader. If she did that, the group might survive longer and she along with them. For if she rendered it possible for them to communicate with the local people, she could help stave off battles, gain important information and aid them in trading more efficiently for food. She does not seem to have hesitated. Within days, the Spaniards were calling her Doña Marina, a title reserved for highborn women in Spain. Mexicans today generally consider Marina to have been a traitor to Native American people. But at the time, Townsend argues, if anyone had asked her if she should show more loyalty to her fellow Indians, she would have been confused. In her language, there was no word that was the equivalent of Indians. Mesoamerica was the entire known world. The only term for people native to the Americans in Nahuatl would have been human beings. In Marina's experience, human beings definitely were not always on the same side. The Mexica were her people's enemies. It was they who had seen to it that she was torn from her family and their merchants had sold her away. Now, this relatively small group of newcomers wanted to make war on the Mexica. No one in her world could have imagined that she owed loyalty to Montezuma's people. While she lived, and for many years afterward, there is no record of surprise at the course she chose. Back on the coast, the Spaniards were hungry and Marina bargained with the locals for food while some of the other women prepared meals. The people grew used to dealing with her and sought her out. They did not have an R in their language and heard her name as Malina. They added the honorific Tsin at the end, which sometimes came out as Melitze. As the Spanish speakers did not have the tsa sound in their language, they sometimes heard Malinche. Thus, when they did not call her Doña Marina, they called her Malinche, which is the name historians know her by. To various groups the Spanish dealt with, this woman seemed to be the most important member of their party. Cortes knew he was dependent on Malinche, and Townsend suggests that he did not like it. In his letters home to the king, he referred to her as little as possible. He had to refer to her at times, or else his whole story would have been suspect, as there were moments when a translator simply had to have been present in order for events to have transpired as they did. What Cortez did not want others to realize was that if Malinche had not been there, they could not have succeeded. Of course, it was possible that if she had not appeared when she did, someone else might have filled this role later. Women who had been taken from their homes as a result of battle and made slaves and, had who no, and who had no love for the Mexica were scattered across the central and coastal areas. But Cortez had been especially lucky. Not all women who hated the Mexica spoke Nahuatl and Yucatec, Yucatec Maya. And of those who did, not all of them were daughters of noblemen and spoke with such finesse, with the ability to understand and use the high register of the nobility. An asset 
in negotiations with Nawat leaders. Nor did all of them have such a subtle understanding of complex situations. Furthermore, with her gift for languages, Belinche began to learn Spanish from De Aguilar and within a few months could carry on on her own. In the meantime, she helped Cortez to lay his plans. Messengers came back from Montezuma twice, each time bearing gifts and promising more in the future, but they refused to escort Cortez and his party to the Aztec capital city, Tenochtitlan, supplying excuses. You can see the causeways down the center and to the left and the right. These are very important in the story. Cortez was determined to get there. He had decided that he would either conquer this city or if that was impossible, then he would trade for marvelous goods and bring back specific intelligence of place to Spain. In either case, he would be hailed as a great discoverer. Okay, this shows Cortez after he'd been hailed as a great discoverer. The original is not available, but this is a portrait based on it. Rebuffed by Moctezuma, Cortez considered what he had learned from some nearby Totonic people and from Malinche herself, namely that Moctezuma had many enemies that would help him in his travels. He could proceed by making his way first to a rebellious Totonic town and then go to Tlaxcala, where the people hated the Mexica. There, his forces would have access to food and water and other support. You can see Tlaxcala as the gray blob to the right of Tenochtitlan in the picture. It's a rather large area independent of the Aztecs. Before setting out, Cortez asked the high-ranking Puerto Calero to return to Spain and speak directly to King Charles V. This was not just a maneuver to get rid of the man who kept him from having Malinche all to himself. Puerto Calero's high status meant that he could take responsibility for sending more men, supplies, horses and arms. Cortez needed to make sure that more support was on the way if he was going to bring down the Mexica. Cortez ordered that the remaining ships be beached. It was a way of preventing discontented men from easily going home. The Spaniards stayed for two months in a nearby Totonic settlement, securing a formal alliance with the Totonic and preparing for march toward Tenochtitlan. You can see on the right, the blonde haired man is Cortez and then the only woman is the representation of Malinche. This would be a drawing done after the conquest. The first major polity that they encountered on the way to Tenochtitlan was Tlaxcala. And here you can see the outline of the travels. It was quite a winding way. And there's, and left of the center is Tlaxcala. Though, though the Tlaxcaltec were initially hostile to the Spaniards and their allies, they later permitted the Spaniards to enter the city. The Tlaxcalans Collins negotiated an alliance with the Spaniards through Malinche and Aguilar. Later Tlaxcalan visual records of this meeting feature Malinche as a prominent figure. 
He's bigger than Cortez, as you can see in this drawing. She bridged communication between the two sides as Tlaus Colin presented the Spaniards with gifts of food and noble women to cement the alliance. After several days in Tlaus Cala, Cortez continued the journey to Tenochtitlan. By then, he was accompanied by a large number of Tlaus Colin soldiers, tripling the size of his expedition. Now, this drawing was put together in a history of Tlaxcala, done by Tlaxcala intellectuals and artists. And you can see that the Tlaxcalics are much larger than Cortez, even on his horse. <laughs> Montezuma's spies have been helping him keep track of Spanish movements since 1518, and he was aware of the Los Colin Spanish Alliance. He decided to send messengers offering annual tribute, including gold, silver, slaves, and textiles to be delivered as the Spanish desired. The only provision was that they not enter his lands as he claimed he could not host so large a company. Montezuma and his council assumed that this arrangement was what the foreigners sought. What the Mexica king could not afford, politically speaking, was a confrontation with such forces so close to home. He knew from his sources that the strangers won their battles. Even if he collected a mighty army and did manage to bring them and their allies down, his kingdom would still be lost, for the casualties would be immense, beyond anything calculable from past experience. And if he could not deliver an easy victory in the heart of his kingdom, his allies would not continue to stand with him. Moctezuma could not afford a battle. He did not even want the strangers to come close enough for comparisons to be drawn. But his plan failed. The Spanish and the Tlaxcalans Collins turned down his offer of tribute and continued onwards. The combined forces reached Tenochtitlan in early November, 1519, crossing a causeway leading to the beautiful island city. Cortez on background, on, on horseback, with Malinche walking at his side. After ceremonial greetings by hundreds of kingdom dignitaries, they were met by Moctezuma, standing under a magnificent canopy with bits of gold and precious stones. A meeting indoors immediately took place between the king and the Spanish leaders. Malinche was central to this event. Montezuma's flowery speech at the time, delivered through Malinche, was later claimed by Cortes to represent a submission to the Spaniards. But this interpretation is not followed by modern historians. The deferential nature of the speech can be explained by Moctezuma's usage of a Nahuatl register known for its indirection and complex set of reverential affixes. Despite Malice's apparent ability to understand this speech, it is possible that some nuances were lost in translation. The Spaniards, deliberately or not, may have misinterpreted Moctezuma's words. It was important for Cortez, writing back to the Spanish royal court, to represent his dealings with indigenous leaders. In the most just light possible, the court was to be led to believe that the rulers of the Aztecs willingly accepted Spanish sovereignty and that Spanish domination was thereby legal. Montezuma continued to govern 
in the weeks and months that followed. He treated the Spanish and Tlaxcalan leaders like honored guests, despite the grain drain on his resources at feeding so large a company. He persistently questioned them through Malinche, trying to learn what he was up against. The Spaniards toured the city, rudely demanding gifts everywhere they went. Their hosts remembered them chortling and slapping each other on the back when they saw Moctezuma's personal storehouse and were told they could take what they liked. The Spaniards took beautiful gold jewelry and melted it down to gold bricks. Moctezuma showed the Spanish maps and tribute lists in an effort to get them to name their price and go away. He clearly hoped to convince them to leave and to have established the most favorable possible relationship with them by the time they did. The weeks of tension dragged on until April of 1520, five months after the Spanish and their forces had arrived in Tenochtitlan. Cortes learned that the governor of Cuba, who was an enemy of his, had sent 800 Spaniards in 13 ships led by Captain Panfilo de Narvaez, who had a permit to explore the mainland. Moctezuma learned of Cortez's apprehension and for the first time ordered his people to prepare for war. In desperation, Cortez took the king hostage, put him in chains where he would remain for 80 days. The Spaniards threatened Moctezuma with death if he ordered his people to resist. Only with a knife at Montezuma's throat could Cortes assure the new, newly arriving Spaniards whom he sought to encounter that he was in control of the kingdom. And with the newly arrived Spanish forces, he hoped to stave off a violent rejection on the part of the Indians. Cortes took Malinche and a substantial portion of his men and traveled with haste down to the coast. In a surprise nighttime attack on Narbaz's camp, Narbaz was captured and the rest of his men reached an agreement to join Cortes. Besides 800 additional men armed with steel, Cortes now had 80 additional horses and several ships filled with supplies at his disposal. After two weeks, as Cortes was in the midst of making plans, news came that the people of Tenochtitlan were in rebellion against the 80-man Spanish force that had stayed back. The Spanish force under, under the questionable leadership of Pedro de Alvarado, had massacred a large group of young Wichica men during a religious celebration. Cortez's large force started out at once. Once they reached the city, an urban battle broke out. The fighting began every day at dawn as soon as there was light enough to see. The Spaniards could not escape because the Mexica dismantled the causeways. But the Mexica could not penetrate Spanish defenses either. At length, Moctezuma tried to speak to Mexicas from a rooftop. He spoke following in the Nahua understanding of the paramount duty of a ruler to save the lives of his people so that the community could continue into the future. As reported, the king said, let the Mashika hear, we are not their match. May the people be dissuaded from future fighting. Townsend argues that after 18 years as ruler of tens of thousands of people, Moctezuma knew that many people around them hated the Mexica. 
furthermore, he had spent some five months conversing seriously with Malinche and the Spaniards, and he knew that many more of the strangers were coming. He understood that in this case, no victory would be permanent. Young warriors of the city, however, felt that it was not their duty to be circumspect, but rather to fight to the death if necessary to defend their honor. Speaking through Malinche, a younger half-brother of Montezuma told Cortez that even if 25,000 of the Mexica died for each Spaniard they killed, they would finish with the Spanish because the Mexica were many and the Spanish were few. Cortez decided that escape from the island was the Spaniards' only hope of survival. As the Spaniards prepared their escape, Cortez ordered the death of Moctezuma, lest he serve as a rallying point for his own people. The Spanish later claimed that the Aztec was killed by his own people, but with her knowledge, of Nahuatl language sources and culture, Townsend finds that implausible. The escape over makeshift bridges as Mexicas attacked in canoes came to be known among the Spanish as La Noche Triste, the Night of Sorrows, because about 600 Spaniards died that night and an even greater number of Tlaxcalans. Collins. Sadly for the Mexicans, sadly for the Mexicans and other indigenous people, in a matter of weeks, the deadly smallpox struck. It had arrived in Mexico with Narbaza's 13 ships. Most of the Europeans had been exposed, exposed to smallpox before and were, in effect, inoculated but the indigenous were a previously unexposed population, utterly without defenses. By the time the Spaniards and their surviving allies had dragged themselves back to Tlaxcala, the disease had reached there, and many thousands of people were dying of it. Amidst this crisis, the Tlaxcalan leaders came together for a series of great council meetings where it was pointed out that Spanish warmongering had cost the lives of hundreds of young Tlaxcalan warriors. Some leaders were for killing the Spaniards. Others argued that the armed Spaniards with their remaining horses could inflict extraordinary damage. A Tlaxcalan princess, who was in a relationship with one of Cortez's associates, informed the council that thousands more Spaniards would be coming. Malinche spoke, agreeing, saying it would be wisest to stay the course and cement the alliance to ultimately gain the upper hand over Tenochtitlan. This position carried the day. Over the next year, buttressed by ships arriving either from Cuba or Spain, Cortes engaged in building alliances and terrorizing those who stayed loyal to the Aztecs. With the assistance of their allies, Cortes's men finally prevailed in advancing, in advancing toward Tenochtitlan. May 26, 1521, Cortes began a policy of attrition towards the city, cutting off supplies and subduing the Aztecs' allied cities. During the siege, he organized the construction of sailing vessels in the lake and slowly destroyed blocks of the city to avoid fighting in an urban setting. The Mexicas would fall back, but they succeeded in ambushing the pursuing Spanish forces, inflicting heavy causes. Heavy losses. The siege of Tenochtitlan ended on August 13th. 
17 days later, with Spanish victory and much destruction of the city. Two years of chaos followed, and gradually the Spanish directed the construction of a cathedral and government buildings in the renamed Mexico City, capital of Imperial New Spain. During this time, Meliche continued to perform her duties as translator, cultural interpreter, and negotiator. It was a difficult period after the fall of Tenochtitlan, as the Spanish went on looting sprees, seeking hidden treasure. Townsend notes that in community after community, Belinche was made to stand on a pyramid, parapet and shout orders to bring the treasure. Then she had to watch the punishments meted out if the Spaniards judged that orders were not being obeyed. In trying to put some kind of governing apparatus together, there was an increasing demand for Spanish and Nahuatl speakers. And Malinche was also in demand as a teacher. At the heart of all negotiations unfolding, as the new government took fitful shape, she grew powerful herself. As soon as the strains of the war of conquest had ended, Malinche conceived a child by Cortez. It was a boy, Cortez's first son. They named him Martin, after Cortez's father. In letters, Cortez revealed love for the child, and for a while, he considered Martin his heir. He did not live with the boy and his mother, though. Malinche was removed to her own household, for Cortez's Spanish wife, Doña Catalina, traveled to Mexico to join him after the peace was made. Theirs was known not to be a happy marriage. And when Catalina died suddenly, it was rumored that Cortez had strangled her. In the meantime, Malinche was running her own household, earning money to maintain herself, her son, and her staff through small business ventures that her language skills and connections made it possible for her to operate. She was translating in multiple venues, high and low, and was training other translators. She wore an elaborately embroidered wipia blouse over a fine skirt, as well as sandals, unlike other women who mostly went barefoot. Townsend writes that, quote, all this signaled her status, but she did not grow overbearing or boastful nor did she choose to switch to Spanish dress. People remembered her as a cheerful, honorable, and extraordinarily competent person who had done her best to establish order in the nearly lawless early months. And Townsend goes on. Some have assumed that Malinche was, widely, was wildly in love with the conqueror and made his desires her desires. However, concubines in the world she came from knew better than to expect lasting romantic love from their masters. And Cortez was betting so many women and had enraged so many mothers and husbands that it would have been impossible for Malinche to believe that there was a special bond between them. After the death of Catalina, Cortez aimed to marry another fine lady from Spain. It was a way he could be certain of maintaining his present power and influence. In mid-1524, Cortez decided on an ill-advised expedition to Honduras. He took along the titular Aztec king, Cuauhtémoc, and several other Mexica lords as hostages so that their people would not rebel in Cortez's absence. Malinche had to leave her son in accompanying the enormous cavalcade. Early in the venture, she was married to a high-ranking lieutenant of Cortez, 
a nobleman named Juan Jaramillo, one of the few single men in Cortez's circle at the time. Married to Jaramillo, Malinche would have the legal protections of a Spanish lady. As a wedding present, Cortez assigned her natal village of Alutla as an encomienda and a state. Four months into the expedition, Cortez had Cuauhtémoc executed along with at least one other high-ranking Aztec noble. It is unclear what happened, but allegedly Cortez believed the Aztec king to be plotting against him. The expedition lasted about two years and ended with the loss of life of many involved and the near starvation of the survivors. Liche and Jaramillo's, Jaramillo's daughter, Maria, was born in the midst of the expedition. They returned to Mexico City with the remains of the expedition in 1526. Three years later, Malinche died. She was survived by her son, Don Martin, who would be raised primarily by his father's family in Spain, and the daughter, Doña Maria, who would be raised by Jaramillo and his second wife, Doña Beatriz de Andrada. Martin is often spoken of as the first mestizo. Today's historians give credit to Malinche's diplomatic skills. In fact, old conquistadors on various occasions recalled that one of her greatest skills had been her ability to convince other Indians of what she believed, that it was useless in the long run to stand against Spanish metal arms and Spanish ships. Whether this in hindsight makes her traitor is not something I have the competence to judge. Certainly old world diseases weakened indigenous resistance. What is clear is that she was a remarkable person in a remarkable time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you, Pam, how old was she when she died? In... She would have been about 29. If she yeah. was born in 1500, oh. she would have been 29. Okay. <laughs> and and what, I know people died young then, but what is, was there a, a reason that she died, an illness or? Well, Townsend figures that she died because of the diseases that were killing everybody else. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any way to know, probably for sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, questions. I have so many, but the rest of you, <laughs> do you have questions for Pam? Go ahead, well, Errol. Okay, if not, okay, let me ask those two children, mm -hmm. uh, the, the daughter and the son, uh, Martine, and do we know, uh, did Townsend follow through what had happened? Uh, they were raised, I know, in Spain. Is, is there? The Townsend follows through, and you can also find out if you Google Martine. Um, Martin grew up in Spain. He became a page in the court of Philip II, as his father wanted. Um, eventually, oh yes, and um, Cortez married a Spanish noblewoman and had another son named Martin after, when, as a result of that marriage. So that son was made his heir once he had his own legitimate son. And both Martin and Martin go back to Mexico and there's some very complex politics that go on. And finally, the first Martin is um, exiled from Mexico. He's accused of plotting against the Viceroy in some trumped up case. So he goes back to Spain and he uh, serves the court and is sent down 
south in Spain to fight against the Muslims. And he's killed in battle there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened to uh, Maria. I mean, she got married and had children, I expect, but I'm not sure of anything more than that. But um, Jaramillo and his wife Beatriz didn't have any other children. So she was um, Jaramillo's only heir. And when he died, his wife got two thirds of his fortune and Maria got one third. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you for that. I, I, tell you, I hear these stories and I mean, part of me, I, I just feel so bad, you know, yeah. <laughs> about yeah. all of it. And it's hard to judge. It's hard, you know, we're looking back so many centuries ago, but, um, you know, one thing you mentioned that Malinche is regarded <clears throat> as a traitor, and that's uh, what I've always, uh, uh, you know, heard. And, um, but I, I wonder there, what would have happened had she not been there? I mean, I, I'm always interested in rewriting history with one, one element changed and, and what would have occurred. And it makes you wonder uh, how they could have formed these alliances, uh, you know, without her. Well, isn't, isn't well, for one thing, you have to keep in mind that there were a lot of enemies of the Mexicas. Of course, of course. And Cortez yeah. appears to have been a very dominating personality and a skillful um, tactician in warfare. Um, but um, at the, Townsend argues that at the moment that she was asked to become the translator, when there were only 400 um, Spaniards at the time. She, it, it was her own survival mechanism because if they people, these people died and she was their slave, she would die too. That's right, yeah. David, you had a question. Well, I was just gonna say, it's kind of th that old cliche, my, my enemy's enemy is now my friend. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So much of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Melanie has a question. Yeah. Hi, um, Ellen. Is there anything left of the island in the city, or did yeah. Pam? I mean, <laughs> um, it, was it totally filled in and covered up? There is there any remains of the old city? There's there's some water left, which is remainder of Lake Texcoco, um, and year by year ruins are uncovered as construction takes place in the city so that um, there are ruins of um, Tenochtitlan um, which are visible. You can Google it and you'll see pictures. I think, I think that's where I saw the pictures um, on the internet, Tenochtitlan. Mm -hmm. And how, how long were those causeways and did it must have taken many, many years to build them? The causeways? Yeah, over the water. I have no idea how long they were, um, but I'm not sure it would take so long to build them. Um, they just stacked up. Well, they, 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 could, they, the Aztecs were very clever when we saw originally that they had built those uh, little floating gardens to grow food. And yeah. I think the floating gardens in Mexico City are some remains of that lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Xochimilco, still... are you talking about Xochimilco there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask that question if that was, that water was the remains uh, of the original lake. And, uh... well, it was mostly, a fairly it's been, mostly... swampy. Pardon? Sorry, it was a fairly swampy and marshy kind of lake wasn't it it wasn't a yeah it was that's that's one reason why the mexica could could um settle on the island because it wasn't inhabited nobody wanted it because it was so uh, marshy <laughs> well yeah. i think there's a problem even now of mexico city sort of sinking because yeah. it's yeah. on that marshy ground 
Yeah. Well, I think we need to all travel to Mexico City and uh, continue this. I haven't been to Mexico City since the 1970s. Mm. And, Is a real uh, trip for us? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> David suggests a field trip. That's what we need. Yeah. Well, Stephanie can organize a bus for us and uh, <laughs> all the way to Mexico. All the way to Mexico. The <laughs> well, the uh, Museum of Anthropology is fabulous. Yes. Yeah. Have, Have you been there? Yeah. What well, you I know I've. I've when I, uh, when Carol and I were there back in the mid seventies, you know, we just did the tourist things and I didn't have all of this knowledge and interest that I have now. And that's why I, you know, I really, every year I talk about it. Well, when are we going to Mexico city and Oaxaca and all these wonderful places, mm. Merida that we've never seen, but we can't leave all of us. We love it so much. No. <laughs> I traveled there by train from Tucson. Oh my. Oh. Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should have... fly in, forget the bus. <laughs> yeah, forget the bus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I know the train was there. It was wonderful back, you know, 50 years ago and whatever. Well, the trains weren't wonderful, but it was nice to have a train. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were pretty bad. They were old. Okay, well, do we have more, more questions about the presentation uh, for Pam? And uh, I hope we, we get this, this uh, Townsend's book uh, into our library. That's a good idea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. one more. Hi. So, great. Hi, Melanie. Hi. Anne has one more. Okay, goodbye. Hi, um, Pam, how long did it take, Cortez? I missed the beginning, was it? like a year from here to, to conquest or more than a year to take the city? Um, well, the uh, Noche, La Noche Triste was in um, 1520 and the, um, the uh, exactly. final victory over the Aztecs was in August. Um, La Noche Vice, La Noche Triste, I think, was in April, fifteen twenty. But the um, victory was in August, fifteen twenty one. So, it, so it took a year of planning, making alliances, fighting here and there, terrorizing villages that wouldn't join up with them, etc. It's just amazing to me how fast in those times some of these things moved. You know, you read even like histories of diplomats going, going, you know, to Paris and then back to Boston and things like that. And how they did that in, in those short periods of time just kind of amazes me. Well, the Spaniards were helped by the fact that thousands of people were dying um, of smallpox and yeah. maybe other diseases as well. Yes, Errol? Oh, I was just going to say, you mentioned uh, how uh, Cortez got messages and, uh, and Moctezuma had his spies. I, I guess these were groups of people traveling by horseback. How You just wonder how that information, it's kind of picking up on what uh, David was saying how that information got back and forth. Well, from uh, Pan, Panfilo Narvarez's group, um, some people who didn't agree with Narvarez and who knew about um, um, Cortez and Tenochtitlan and managed to escape, and they went to Tenochtitlan and Formed Cortez that oh. Nalvarez had landed. Okay, so the people travel back and forth. But yeah, yeah, it, it is. A, it's an amazing story, and uh, you know. And I thank you, Pam, for refreshing us all in this. Well, I enjoyed year. it. <laughs> thank you. Well, we we have enjoyed it very much too. Oh. Uh, before we close the meeting today, now, 
are we go we're going to video uh, both my presentation and the annual meeting, or do we need to videotape the annual meeting? I don't think we need to video the annual meeting. I think your presentation is enough. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Um, <clears throat> I'll start the video and then just chop it off and the only thing that will go online. Um, we may need, you know, uh, I'll put it in our files, the annual meeting, because we always do a report on it. So mm -hmm. I'll video, but I won't uh, send that out over the, uh, the internet and yeah. <clears throat> only my uh, presentation that I'm really looking forward to. I love to talk about bandits, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but he was a model for Zorro. I know, and, and I thought about starting the presentation with that theme music from Zorro in the 1950s. Probably you can all hum it and uh, remember the words, can it, you know, and uh, I thought that'd be a great way to start. But anyway, I'll have that for next week and, and our, our season of presentations will come to a close oh. and it's sad, but then we have several months to plan out the next year. And it'll well, Al, tell us how you're doing. Well, I'm, I, yeah, I'm doing okay. I talked to Susan a little bit, um, but right. Pam, thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and I'll end the meeting if I've got your all permission and, and we'll meet again next week. Okay. All right, best wishes, Harold. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam.